After stem cell transplant, typically we do restaging at somewhere between day 90 to 100, and that would include the usual labs, 24-hour uh, urine, uh, the imaging to ensure that there's no radiologic disease, and finally the marrow. Um, the marrow, we now not only look at histologically uh, just to see if there's any clonal plasma cells left, but there's also increasing interest in looking more, uh, using more sensitive methods, uh, looking for minimal residual disease. Um, so this is an important area of investigation, um, and there's two major uh, types of MRD testing. One is flow-based, the other one is uh, next-gen sequencing. Um, there's some pros and cons to both of them. Um, next-gen sequencing has the advantage that it um, doesn't, is not as variable dependent on in terms of, uh, for flow cytometry, when the aspirate is pulled out, we have to try to get it to the lab quickly because the plasma cells are labile, and then we need to also check uh, how many cells are being counted, how many markers are being tested. And so with all of those quality control issues, it's not as well standardized, whereas next-gen sequencing in some ways is more easily standardized. However, the caveat is that you do need that initial clone from the patient to be able to detect that in the, in the minimal residual disease state. So that's, whereas flow cytometry doesn't require that. Every patient theoretically is valuable for flow, but if a patient didn't have that initial clone for next-gen sequencing, they may not be valuable for MRD. And the other big difference between them is the sensitivity of the test. So it's thought that next-gen sequencing can get up to 10 to the minus sixth, or one in a million, whereas uh, flow, depending on the data, the number of the cells counted, and the channels or the number of antigens tested, it can be 10 to the minus fourth, 10 to the minus fifth. So those are some approaches. And the question is, as a community doctor, or even as any physician, one of the things we're always taught in medical school is if you do a test, how will it change your management of your patient? And I would say in 2017, we don't have an answer for that. And that's why I think this is still in research. And part of it is, uh, as somebody said once, we know if somebody has a hemoglobin of eight, it's gonna be pretty reproducible from lab to lab when you go around the country, and we know that patient's quite anemic. But when you have a test like flow, which is so user dependent and maybe subject to so many quality control issues and not yet well standardized, you may very well get different results at different centers and at different time points, perhaps even from different sides of the marrow. We didn't even mention that the marrow really is contingent on all the other tests being negative. So in other words, you need to have serum being negative, urine being negative, and very importantly, radiologic studies being negative. Because so what if your marrow is negative, but there's still an osseous lesion that's lighting up on PET scan? And so there is this well-understood concept of macrofocal disease where you can have little pockets of myeloma, but the marrow may be negative, and we don't want to be making decisions based on incomplete data. So I would say that this is an important area of investigation. Um, and the other caveat that we didn't mention yet about MRD is the importance of molecular risk. I would like to think that if MRD is negative, it means the same thing for any patient, that it's a great result. However, we know that MRD negativity may not mean the same thing in high-risk patients, which means we have to really think about those patients, and even if it's MRD negative, not necessarily assume that all is well. And lastly, getting back to the changing of therapy, it would be nice to know that if, MRD, if a patient were MRD positive, we should escalate the therapy. And perhaps equally interesting, if you have a low-risk MRD negative patient, can we stop therapy? And I don't think we have any prospective studies to answer these questions, but it's an area of investigation. And probably in the community, if a patient perhaps was having difficulty tolerating maintenance therapy for some reason or was averse to doing it, and you were uh, doing the MRD test that did show negativity, perhaps it would be reasonable for that patient to not do maintenance therapy. But again, acknowledging that this is outside of evidence-based practice. So going back to this patient, uh, whether she was MRD negative or not in 2017, we don't know that we would change our management about lend maintenance, neither the use of lend maintenance nor the duration of lend maintenance. The progression of myeloma can come in two flavors, broadly speaking. One is a biochemical progression, which would be purely paraprotein related. And uh, by myeloma clinical trial criteria, the numbers that we would look for typically would be a, an M spike of, depending on the isotype, 0.5 for IgAs, 1.0 for IgG, the free light chains becoming more than 100 milligrams per liter, or the 24-hour urine now showing more than 200 milligrams per day of Benz Jones protein. So you can have patients with that isolated biochemical relapse, which may be very slow and indolent, 
Conversely, you can have a very fulminant relapse with the crab symptoms that we were just discussing, and perhaps even worse, uh, extramedullary disease, high LDH, circulating plasma cells. So we have to understand that the relapse of myeloma can come in that entire spectrum, and it's important to consider that when making decisions about treatment.